Okay, let's get started. I'm having way too much fun, I can see. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of days ago, I came across this article. Um, not really interested in divorces per se, um, but it, it is using a common visualization technique, um, commonly called a bee swarm. Um, and so what they're doing is for each data point, you're plotting it on the graph. Um, so instead of showing you here's the median and here's the range, it's showing you all the data points, right? And it gives you more information. So here is divorce by occupation. That's, where's my mouse? Right, so what happens is below the median is more drawn out, right? Yeah, if you're really interested, there's. There's software developers. But the bottom part is stretched out, right? And the top part is more squashed. And so there's, um, you start to see how the data is distributed better than just here's the median, here's the extreme ranges, right? You know, and then they show up by different occupations. And it also shows you how, you know, some occupations hardly any data, so you really can't take it. Um, yes, yeah, not that many data points, right? Legal. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what whether it means different sub occupations or not. But here my point is just here is a visualization technique, right? Now we could go, we're looking at this slide, and they're, they're, when Scala and Spark were being developed, when Scala and Spark were being developed, right, there were two important trends happening that affected um, Hadoop, I mean Hadoop and Scala, right? One, as we talked about a week ago, the price of RAM really decreased, right? It was a tremendous decrease. And that really affected how Hadoop and Spark were their goal, development goals. The other trend that was happening in this time was that functional programming was starting to become uh, more common, right? So when Hadoop was started, it was still object-oriented programming and Java still ruled the day. Um, and so Hadoop uses 
Java. You, you, you write programs in Java, and they borrowed two functions from functional programming, and they implement them as methods inside of a class, right? Spark was started later when functional programming has become more, more prevalent, and they borrowed much, much more from the functional world. And that changes. So the result, um, Spark tends to be is faster because it's, it wants to load things in memory as much as it can. And it uses more functional techniques. And so it actually is easier to use and has more functionality. So when it comes between Hadoop and, and Spark, um, you know, Spark tends to be much faster, easier to use, has more functionality. Like, why would you want to use Hadoop? Um, the other thing I want to talk about um, briefly before I go on is when we're dealing with large data sets, right, um, we run across boundaries and barriers that you don't get when you're dealing with a small thing. You know, starting to come across this in your assignment, first assignment, right? Oh, how can I write this file this big? How can I sort this big, this supposedly big list of numbers? Um, so here's an example. We usually think of when accessing RAM is I can access any element, any location in RAM in constant time, right? It's just a, a lookup. Um, but that's not the case, right? So this this is an article someone wrote said, look, you know, I created a link list and you know then I went through and I accessed all the elements and computed how long it took to access per element, right? And it sits there flat, you know, pretty much constant, as you would expect. And this is what we teach in data structures courses, right? And algorithms courses, well, actually memory is all of one. But then when it hits a certain certain point. And then the cost increase and it slowly levels out. And then there's another big jump, another big jump, and it's pretty level, and then, then a big, huge jump, right? So as we, get, as we get things bigger, we start running across different boundaries of performance. And when you're dealing with exabytes of data, you can run across a lot of these things. And of course, what's happening is, you know, the first first set is everything fits in main memory, and then, okay, we we, we have we're paging some of it out to the L1 cache, right, which is not as fast as main memory, and then when we fill that cache up, we then slide over to the L2 cache, and then we slide over to the L3 cache in that particular machine, and then when the L3 cache is filled up. Now we're hitting the desk, right? And that could become really, really slow. And so you just have to keep in mind that you really have to be careful of these, you know, more and more data you get, we run across problems you wouldn't normally think about. Okay, any questions? So Scala, um, some of this you've already read about. So I'll skip over to Jupyter Notebooks. Um, command line, use running it. Um, and functional programming. Um, one thing to keep in mind is when we talk about Hadoop, Hadoop has two major components. One is um, what they call the distributed file system. And typically, Spark uses the distributed file system from Hadoop. It didn't bother to write their own file system. And the other major part of Hadoop is MapReduce. Um, so when people talk about Hadoop, they're talking about both these things, but they're separate things, and you can use one without the, you can use the file system without MapReduce and 
we can actually use Hadoop map reduce without using the file system. For example, when you run an AWS, we can use Hadoop running on top of AWS's file system S3, right, and use map reduce. Right? So those two pieces can be used um together or one or the other. Um, and so Spark typically runs on top of uh, Hadoop file system, but it has about a lot more functional components um, than Hadoop. And so last time, last year, my taught this course, you know, one student was like, why do I, why are we using map and reduce? Like, well, that's because those are the tools that we have when we use uh, Hadoop and Spark. So it becomes important to uh, start um, thinking in terms of map and reduce. So Scala, um, this is a language that was built in reaction to Java being so verbose. Um, but it runs on top of Java, compiled on the bytecode, so it runs wherever the JVM runs. Um, you know, it, it combines functional programming and arbitrarian programming um, in one language. And we'll come across this. Um, Java 8 uh, introduced lambdas into the language. And the virtual machine then added some features to support them. Um, prior to this, functional languages that ran on the JVM, like Scala and Clojure, had to fake it. Um, and so what Scala did in 2.12 is they then rewrote a lot of their code to use the JVM lambdas. Um, Spark hasn't done that yet. And so, um, most versions of Spark that you run, half you run with Scala 2.11, you can recompile Spark to use um, Scala 2.12, um, but you have to recompile it and install it in your cluster. So we'll, we'll use 2.11, and the difference is not that, one of the biggest differences is the fact that they're using underlying Java 8 lambdas. Right, there are a lot of languages that fed into Scala. Um, it's always nice to a little history. Um, you know, it has a basic, all the basic types to get in Java, um, same range as the Java, and you got the various same literals, constants that you get in Java. Um, and there's, you know, some implicit um, conversions that we can make, um, converting a character to int and a int into a character, right? Integer into long. Um, but just be careful because not all the types can convert. The one thing that's sort of weird about Scala is that you know, when you're trying to find all the methods that operate on a particular data type, um, coming from the Java world, you say, well, I'll go to that class and look at the methods. But there are times when some of the methods that operate on that data type are elsewhere. And that can be sort of confusing. Um, and one example is there's this double rich, rich double, um, and there's an implicit conversion between the two. And so we're looking for methods on double or, right, this is this rich double, which has extra methods. Um, and we'll see later when you talk about classes that we can actually uh, do some interesting things. Probably all aware we get type inference, right? All the data types are typed, but the compiler can, I mean, when I assign a string to, to a variable in this declaration, the compiler is smart and say, oh, that's a string, right? 
And usually people get used to doing this, and so they stop, if they drop putting the types in. And occasionally what will happen is when you start getting more complicated situations, you drop all the types, and they're like, well, what's this type, right? Because now it's, you know, an array of these type of arrays of that type of thing. But what is those types of things? I don't remember because I just dropped all the types. Um, Val and var, right? Um, one of the big things about functional programming is that they're pushing immutable types. The reason is um, one is um, for safety. You're telling the user, I don't want this to be changed. Um, it also is safer, right? No one's going to mistakenly change it when they shouldn't change it. But also it makes dealing with threading much easier, right? Because, okay, if it's Immutable, you can't change it, then I can pass it around and multiple threads can access it. And I don't have to worry about all this locking and unlocking and all that sort of stuff. It's just, it's safe, right? So a lot of newer languages are really pushing, um, immutable types. And then there's a sort of catch all, um, anything, right? We can declare the variable to be like any, which means you can hold anything. Um, right. We've got ranges, um, you know, start and beginning, right? And then we can do a start, beginning, and increment. And then we can start doing that for the four statements, right? You know, for um, k equal to one to seven by two, right? And so we get right values you expect. A little bit different than your standard C k equals this semicolon increment range. Um, like Java, you have import statements. The import statements can go anywhere in your code, right? They don't have to be at the very top of the file. Um, you can also declare, have a block, and the block of code then returns a value. Right, so the bottom here, continue the distance, right? Distance is equal to this block. And so what's happening is your execute the block and the value of the last line of that block becomes the value of distance. A little bit different than you're used to in dealing with in Java or C sharp. Right, most things in Scala return a value, and so we can assign it to um, a variable. And if you want to import um, everything in a package, instead of using the star in Java, it's underscore. I don't know why they changed, but they did. Um, Um, an if statement returns a value. Um, so I can basically, what I'm doing here is um, setting first equal to an if statement. And it's commonly done in functional languages rather than uh, having an assignment statement inside the if statement. It's okay if this condition is true, we turn this value up and assign the whole thing to a variable. Um, you know, if they make it return multiple types, right? If we can return multiple types and we assign it to a variable, then that variable is a type in any. Um, 
And then we get this, you know, if I'm this, what's returned if there's no else statement? Well, there's a, a value called any value, which means there's basically nothing there. All right. So any value becomes like an optional in some other languages. Oh, let's see. Other fun we can do is in string interpolation, we can embed um, variables and expressions inside of a string rather than having to convert them to string and combine them like you do in Java. So here I've got two variables, name and age. And I'm embedding the name inside the string and I want to do a computation. And so there's two things you have to do. One is you have to mark the string as having, um, interpolation in it with the F. There's actually three different characters you can use. And then the dollar sign for just the value of a variable. If my computation is dollar sign, then bracket. And so then you get, right, it creates that string. Again, it's a, it's a common feature in newer languages and it just makes creating strings out of data easier to deal with rather than Java. This plus this plus that plus that. Um, and if you drop off the, uh, the marker, the F, then you, it treats it as a literal string. Right, it doesn't. Loops, um, you know, the basic form is for and then parentheses and then some variable arrow point to it and then a range, right? So the range from one to three, we can also do one dot two, three. Um, we also give it a collection, right? We give it an array or a string, um, a list, array buffer, etc. Um, we can also convert things to integers, right? Um, the slightly more complicated loops. Um, so here, um, J is going through from one to three, K is going from minus one to three, and oh, I only interested in the case where J is less than K, right? So it makes it easier to do multiple loops that are combined. Um, using string interpolation. Um, even more complicated loops, right? So we're looking at, you know, j goes from one to three, squared is equal to j squared, and k is goes from one to squared, and erroneous is when, when k is, is a multiple two, right? So they gave us much richer set of uh, expressions we can do in loops. And we can also write it readable. Then there is uh, yield. Um, So here I'm just have a for loop from one to four, and I'm adding one to each element and I'm calling yield. What that does is then creates a, a collection that contains result of all expressions in the loop, right? So I'm going from one to four, adding two to it, and so I get one plus two gives me the first element three, and next one I get two plus two gives me four, right? Um, so it gives us a, a quick way to um, produce, collect all the elements, 
of that loop um, without having to do, do the create the collection and then add inside the loop. So far, so good. Defining functions, you already discovered this, right? So def, the name of the function, argument, and then return type, and then equals, and the body of the function. Of course, this type inference, so we can, we do various things, say, look, um, I already told you that was a float, and I'm doing this computation of the float, so I'm gonna get a float out of this, so the compiler knows that the return type is a float, so we don't have, we can skip that. Um, and then they do some weird things. Um, so here I define a function next, I mean, it's, all it does is add one to the value and returns it. Um, and of course, the standard way of calling it is next parenthesis one. We can also call it next space curly bracket one. Another example, I got my array. Um, there is a function on the array class called contain. So I can do contain parenthesis two, standard, right? Um, I can put space before and after the period. Um, some language don't allow you to do that. We can in Scala. I can put space before the parentheses. I can drop the period, right? It's just data, space, contain, space. Um, and then I can drop the parentheses, right? Um, and then I can do the whole thing with the curly brackets, right? Curly bracket. And then I can put spaces. And then I can drop the period. And then I can, right? Right? So why do they go, I mean, that makes the compiler a lot more complicated. The compiler has to be able to recognize all those expressions, right? Um, so here's an example uh, of why they did this, right? So they have a number of different ways of writing unit tests for Scala. Um, so a Scala test is, now there are ways of doing it, but there's different testing frameworks you can use, right? And so test, Scala test is one framework and it has multiple ways to write tests. Um, so here's an example of doing one and it's like a stack space should space comment space in this block, right? And so it reads, oh, I stack should pop values in this block, right? And you go, what? how is this valid code, right, that we're going to compile? Another question is, why do I want to do this? Well, there's, they're trying to make tests um, self-documenting so you know what's going on. There's also a push to make tests uh, more readable to your business partners, right? So they can actually look at the test and they can see what's going on. And so there's, there are more other versions in, in Scalar Test make it easier to um, write things which other people, non-programmers can actually read. So what they're doing is, of course, so tactically, it really is a stack period should pop values in this argument and then it returns something and then it's dot in, right? Parentheses and the rest of the stuff, right? So one reason why they allow you to put spaces and drop the periods 
And so you could do things like this, right? You can now make things which sort of read like English. So that's why you, you can put spaces and re remove those dots. The reason for being able to replace the parentheses with curly brackets is once you start being able to pass in a block of code as an argument to a function, and we'll see that in a minute, right, when we come back here, we're ba actually passing an entire block of code. It reads, I mean, it, it's just jarring to have a curly bracket and then a bunch of code, then and curly, you know, and parentheses, right? When you start doing this in Java, where you start defining classes and inner classes inside the argument, it looks weird. But as soon as you see that curly bracket, oh, that's a block, right? And then it's just your eyes don't complain so much. So that's why you can you can have either parentheses or curly brackets, right? And so, yeah, I mean, when you look at this, it's sort of weird to see that block of code inside the parentheses. Um, when you add that curly bracket, it's like, oh, there's a block of code that's going to be executed somehow. And at least my mind doesn't complain so much about it. So far, so good? Questions? As I'm sure most of you found out, you can nest functions, right? So you can have functions inside of functions. Um, and if you can nest functions inside of functions, you can return the function, right? Um, so here I'm returning, my add n is returning this adder function. Um, and now I can say add five equals add n of five and then add two of n equal to, right? And then I, since I'm returning a function, add five is a function and add two is a function. Or it's a variable which contains a function and then I can evaluate it as a function. In functional programming, functions become first-class objects. We can pass them around. We can pass them as arguments. We can return them as arguments, um, put them in variables, and do things that you normally do with data, right? Functions and data start to merge together in functional programming. And now, yes. So the question is, is this like a function pointer say in C or C++? Yes. Um, the, the difference is that in C and C++, you are aware of that as a pointer and you have to deal with point manipulation, right? Um, why should a programmer have to deal with those details? Like, you know, the effect we want is I want to be able to return a function. Why do I have to manipulate all the memory to do that? Compilers are very good at that, right? Saying, okay, it's going to return a function, and so we have to do all kinds of work. Um, but yeah, so it's the same idea. But it's a lot easier to use because you don't have to worry about the ampersand and the star, right? It's just you return a function. And the other end, you just evaluated the function. Um, the question is, do we get this property from Java? Well, I would say that um, for a long time, there has been this move um, to remove pointers and languages and replace them with references, right? Um, let the compiler do more of the work. 
Um, you know, I've read that up to 40% of the time spent on design and development of C++ programs is tracing down memory leaks, right? Um, and, and so most languages, even um, with the latest uh, D, uh, Go, right, has references, right? So um, the people who created C, when they created Go, they said, okay, we don't need to explicitly deal with ampersands anymore. And now there is this fun question we can ask, which you all sort of glossed over. Um, when I call add n with five, um, that assigns the parameter in add n of n to be five, right? And typically when a function is done executing, the parameter and all the local variables go away, right? Um, but when I call add five or three, add n is gone. It's no longer, I mean, it's long gone, right? It has been executed. And you can say, well, there's still the activation record there, but that activation record was copied over when we called add n2, right? So how is it when I um, call add 5, it knows the proper value of n? Yes, yeah, so obviously the function I'm returning has a copy of that n, right? So functions know their environment, right? And we start passing them around, they come with their environment. And if their original environment goes away, it's copied for us, right? So this adder function, this environment is the parameter in the function that was created and it knows of that value. It can use it, right? And so when I return that function, this environment is copied for us. And this becomes a real useful tool. Any other questions? We can create anonymous functions, basically functions with no name, and then assign them to variables and then call them. So I'm defining two functions, next and previous. Um, and then I can call them like regular functions, right? And the syntax is pretty similar. It's argument list. You know, equals greater than for the arrow, sort of symbolic, and then a block of code. If we only have one argument, um, we can start simplifying things. So here, um, we can use type inference um, to drop the end part. And if it only has one argument, we can then drop the parentheses. Um, and now here's an example of, right, define another function which has as an argument a function, right? We know it's an argument is a function because the type is int re returns an int. And now I can pass in um, my previous and next anonymous functions into the other function. So not only can we return functions, we'll pass in functions.
functions become first class citizens and we can pass them around um, as appropriate. Now, so here, um, I define next, right, to be a basically a reference to a function. Input int returns an int. Then I can change it to be a different function, which inputs an int and returns an int. Um, I get a can compile error if I do this. Why do I get a compile error when I did it with next line above? I didn't type the X, so it doesn't know what it's going to be, right? Whereas in next, I first did it so it knows the type of next is int input returns an int. Now I could do something like this, right? I give it a type. The question. Um, or if I type X, right, I don't have to provide the type of the, of the function directly. Right, so. Now you, you, you start to see more of the things about scale that some people don't like. And that is, there are a number of ways of doing the same thing, right? Oh, I have a function with one argument. Well, I don't, parentheses or not parentheses, right? Um, but the syntax gets to be a bit more complicated and there's things get, get interesting. And so some people say there's, you know, and scale it is like three different ways of the same thing, and then just becomes a little bit too much. Um, if you if there's only one argument, um, we can just replace that argument with underscore. All right. So another option. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, so the question about this um, int arrow int, um, that's declaring that this variable is of type, it's a function, a reference to a function, and the input is an int and the return type is an int. Okay. The bank fans. The um that sort of ASCII arrows is to indicate oh I'm going from here to there, right? This in, that out, yeah. And now we can go back to earlier example um, where I've had this add n function was returning a function. Um, we can simplify it now greatly. And now, now it becomes sort of weird, right? Um, and it does take a while for your mind to get used to this idea. Um, in the first case here, it's clear I'm returning the function, right? Because I, I define a function normally, and then I give it the name. Done, right? 
Um, here, what do I do is I, like I, I say I'm going to add in has one argument is an integer and a return type is a function because it's parenthesis int arrow int, right? So it's going to return a function of that inputs an integer and return is return value is integer. And then I can just say underscore plus n. Well, the n is clear. The n comes to the first is the arg argument to add n, right? But the underscore refers to the fact that, oh, I'm creating a anonymous function, right? And the underscore is the argument to that anonymous function. And so I'm returning the anonymous function. But the fact that I'm doing that is less clear until you get used to the scale up way, right? The first one is like, oh, it's clear I'm returning a function, but I define a function that returns name. The second one is like, looks like I'm just going to add something together and return a value, but no, I'm returning a anonymous function. How do you specify it? How do I specify that value? Um, that is the argument to the function, right? So if I were to say, um, foo, you know, val foo equals add in five, foo now is a function with one argument. And I call it foo parenthesis value, and that value goes here. Well, the question is, what if I do some other value? If I do foo 12.3, compiler's going to complain because you said, right, it returns a function of int to int. And so when I say foo equals add in of three, the compiler going to say foo now is going is going to be a, a reference to a function of int to int. And that's another thing you have to get used to, right? When you deal with Java, right, everything you have to, you have to put the type everywhere, right? Here, 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 here. So it becomes clear, oh, this is always an int, it's always a float, right? With type inference, you could, it starts to look like Python, right? It's just, Var this, var that, val this, with no types, right? Um, so the types are there, and the compiler does check. And it, and if it ever gets to the point where the compiler cannot figure out what the type is going to be, it will let you know. And I'll say, I'm sorry, but I have no idea what type of type is going to be. So you have to give me more information. Scala is strongly typed. It checks all type uses. Any other questions? Before we go on to the very weird stuff. Oh no, this is not. This would be basically a review, right? Closure. Um, by closure, we mean, right, um, the function knows this environment. So here we've got this function add in again. Um, and now, it's, I'm not using the shortest version of it, but I'm using a version where I define the function and then returning it. And now I can have this program where I declare add three to be a reference to a function. Um, and then I assign it 
add n of three, and then I call two on, you know, call a function with value two. And again, here's the problem. When I run this code, I create an activation record. And so this first statement, right, basically, um, puts in some activation record, there's a, there is a, there is a place for that variable, right? And I can then point to a function pointer. When I call this add in, I'm now calling a function. So I, on my activation record, I create another activation, activation record stack. I put, create another activation record and it's going to contain the parameter to that function, right? Which is n because it's three. And now when I come back down to here, right, to execute this add three, right, that activation record is gone. Right? So how does add three find the value of n, right, when that activation record is gone? And the answer is, you know, the, the function acts as a closure, so it, it keeps its it knows the environment, and when if the environment ever goes away, it'll keep it, it'll retain a copy of it. So the question of where is that the reference? Um, it's clearly not stored in the original activation record, right? Um, and so that question is, you know, where is this, where is the memory that um, add three points to? Is it in the activation record itself or is it on the heap, right? And it's possible to put it in either place, right? Because the compiler will know it's quote at compile time, the compiler will know the environment for um add three, right? So so it can compute how much space it needs to store its environment. And so it could possibly store it in the activation record if it, people really wanted to do that. Or it could store it on the heap. I don't, I'm not sure where um, Scala does it. Other questions? Right, so... The closure will maintain the data in the environment that that function was created in. And this also is a very common feature of um, functional languages, although it's not unique to functional languages. Um, you know, Smalltalk was the original object oriented program language and it does the same thing. Now we get to some weird stuff. Um, partially evaluated functions. So here I create a, a function sum with three arguments. Um, and then to help us keep track of what's going on, I, the first statement, and it just prints something out so we know when it's actually executed. Um, and all it does is add the three things together. And then what happens is I set partial sum equal to sum. And then what I do is I give it basically two parameters, one and five, and the middle one, right, I say underscore colon int. What this is telling the compiler is, 
I want to return a function, um, the function sum, but I only want to give it two parameters. And so partial sum now is going to be a function of one argument, right? And now, basically, I want to print out, I want to call partial sum with the second, with that middle argument supplied. And I haven't printed before. And so what happens is this gets printed out first, right? Before call, because when I assign sum with two arguments instead of three, it's not evaluated. And then when I, when I supply that middle argument, you know, then the function is actually called, right? We get, so I get before call and start, and then I actually sum things up, and then I, So the question is, why do we have to tell it that it's an int? I'm not sure. And I didn't try without it, but it may not be required yet. I'm not sure. Yes, that, that is what we're doing is. Yeah, so what we're doing is when I that first call the sum, I'm returning a function of one argument, right? But it it knows those two other arguments so that when you recall it, you can supply them and call the the original sum. So that so they're clear what's going on here. Now, I think you have to admit that it is sort of weird, right? Now, there's there's two interesting questions we can ask. The first one is why, right? Why would we go all the work of doing this? Any? We already find more functions do about the same thing, right? Um, but why would, why would we need more functions to do about the same thing? What's that? What's third option? What are we optimizing? This isn't going to help us do things in parallel. Yeah, this this particular construct doesn't help us with parallelization at all. Why would we ever want to take one of the arguments out? We can make it a constant. Oh, do we ever have situations where you may have some default values, which makes sense? And then we want to, right, instead of having, we can create one function with all parameters and all the, some situations. Situations where a couple of those parameters are always going to be the same. But they're repeating ourselves of making those things all the same. We can just do this and give those values to those arguments and get a new function with just these remaining ones, right? And then pass that around. Okay, now we can do it that way.
So it's one way of saying, oh, I'm on reuse this function over and over again, but sometimes some of the parameters will be always the same. So here we go, right? I, I can just give them it and then get the new function and use that instead. The next interesting question is, how do they do this? How would we do this? Yeah, so what we'll do is the compiler is going to create another function, right? And that function has to do two things. It has to remember the two arguments, one and five. And it then want, it needs one argument, and then it's going to actually call some, right? So this closure is going to act like a wrapper around the original sum. And since this has to be eventually done inside of Java, right? Um, so pre-Java 8, the way it was done is you'd create a separate class and you'd give it one static method and that method would hold a pointer to another, um, well, sum itself would become a, a static method and a separate class. Um, and so then this partial sum would be another class with one method um, that ha held a reference to that particular other class, right? And so if you know about design patterns, you're basically using, right, the wrapper pattern or Right. Higher order functions. Um, higher order functions are basically functions that act on functions. Right. So you, you give it, you give it functions, arguments, and it do things. Um, so here's a silly one where, um, you know, pass function, you, you pass in a function, and then you evaluate that function on, in this case, um, three arguments. Oh, and then I'm doing oh weird thing to um what is new sum? Well if I'm dealing with um I can use the underscore to specify all three arguments, right? Um and then I can evaluate one, two, three, or I can just pass in new sum to new pass, and it then new pass will actually evaluate that function. And when I teach functional programming, this idea of higher order functions and getting people to use them is the, the hardest thing for them to do. It is just, it takes a while for your mind to get used to the idea of just passing functions around and evaluating them. And it takes about a month, right? Of just beating your head against the wall before you say, Oh, yeah, this is a function. I can just pass it in and do this.
So far, so good. Do you have some more weird things before I start calming down? You ready? Curried functions. Um, it's not named after famous Indian dishes. No, it's there was a person named Curry, Curry, and he developed a lot of lambda calculus, which is a lot of functional programming is based upon. Um, okay. I'm defining a function, but the definition is sort of weird, right? It's weird because normally when you've got two arguments, it's parentheses, argument one, comma, argument two, or we could do curly brackets, right? No, but that's only with one argument. So we have to do parentheses. With here, it's parentheses, argument one, End parenthesis, begin parenthesis, argument two. When I call it, I actually call it with parenthesis, first argument, end parenthesis, parenthesis, second argument. And of course, I can do this with multiple, I'm doing it with two, I can do it with three or four, right? And no, you cannot, you cannot combine both arguments, right? Here, what I'm doing is like, I'm, I don't, I want to, um, Just provide one parameter, right? And the other parameter is not defined yet. And so partial sum becomes a function with one variable, one argument. And then I can call it. Now, if I define the type as I do in partial sum two, right, then I can just say equals curry sum one. Now, what's going on, um, when I define curry sum, what I'm really saying is I'm creating a function that has one argument, and it's going to return another function that also has one argument. And that's why we do this. We basically evaluate first parentheses, that's the first function, and then the second parenthesis is given the value for the second function's return from the first one. So this looks like I'm just putting we're present then, but it's basically saying, look, evaluate that first function and return, it returns a function, and now we're going to evaluate that second function. And so now I can do partial sum two. And of course, this is scalar, so we, we've got multiple ways of doing the same syntax. So I could just say, Courage sum one, but now I'm saying, okay, that second function, oh, what that underscore says is return a function that, right? Now, courage functions um, are very, not only common in Has a language called Haskell, in Haskell, whenever you define a function with multiple arguments, they're always, always curried for you, right? 
And so you're always, what you're doing is you're always, you've got three arguments. You redefine a function. And we, the first function has one argument, which turns it, another function has one argument, which turns a function with another argument. That's all. Um, the way, the way it works, right? In Haskell. Um, and so there's all kinds of crazy things we can do. Right. And then we can evaluate it. Um, and this makes it, this makes it clear because what's the data type? The data type says, oh, it's a function which returns what? It returns a function which returns an int. And for some reason, that gives a compile error. But again, when you first see this, it's like, Weird, right? It's just weird. Why would you ever want to do this? This is so bizarre. Some people have just gone on the deep end, right? Um, but of course, doing this requires a lot of work, right? Because you have to get a compiler to accept all these syntax and to generate the proper code on the back end. Um, and since this is running on the JVM, it takes a lot of work to make this work in the JVM. So they didn't do it just out of a whim, right? It's actually a very powerful construct, um, and if you ever become have the opportunity to program in Haskell, you'll beat your head against the brains for several months before you figure things out. But eventually, it makes sense, and you start to realize how powerful this is. So we have a few minutes left. A bonus slide. Um, Give an example of where we might want to use this. Um, so what is this random int doing, right? Um, I'm defining a function. It's a curried function, right? Because it's got two arguments, but the second one is empty. It doesn't need any value, right? And what does this function so it returns a, right? What does a function do? Well, it takes that first argument and it's then going to call a the random number generator, which returns a float and multiplies it that integer and then convert it to an int. But here is the weird thing, right? Um, again, this is not, when I call random int, and give it one argument, it returns the function. It doesn't evaluate that to a number yet. It's just going to say, oh, that's the function that we're going to return. Right? So far, so good. And so if I do this, right, it returns a function. This is going to pass in 10, and then I have to evaluate that, that function as it returns, and I get some number of be integer between 0 and 10, right? And so I could do this, right? And now when I call generator, it's going to return. I can call it over and over again, right? And it's going to return a number between 0 and 10, 0 and 10, 0 and 10. And so what does this do? Um, array fail, right? It says, give me an array of size 4. And then and that curly brackets expects a function. And it's going to call that function for each element of the array. And what that function returns is going to put that value in there, right?
And so what does that line do? Yeah, it creates an array of size four and fills it with four random integers in each location, right? So basically, in two lines of scalar code, we can we can generate an array of an arbitrary size, right, and fill it with random integers. There are a lot of weird things in Scala that come from the functional world. And if you're not used to it, just being bizarre, and it takes a while to get used to. Now, time is over. As you all know, you have an assignment due tomorrow. And I'll warn you, I have to warn you about this. When I say the assignment is due at 11.59, I mean 11.59. If you turn it in at midnight, it's late. And when you come to me and say, oh, I was only off by a second, the answer is, so you're late, right? I look at the timestamp and it says after that time it's late. Full penalty. 